workshop. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> All right, girls. So what I'm going to do, um, so welcome to my um, workshop. This is the first one that I've done, which has really been, which is going, where I'm going to be focusing on weight loss for 40 plus women. And we're going to, and I'm going to be talking a lot about hormones. And for those of you, I know everyone that's on here that's with me now, I know you girls all know me and you know my story, but for anyone that's going to watch the replay, um, I'm just going to go a little bit into my background. So I actually didn't get into the health and fitness industry until eight years ago um, after a really messy divorce about 10 years ago. Um, it was really my, it was actually the time when I got right into my health and fitness. I hired a PT. I made sure I was like up at 4 a.m. every morning. Um, and that training with PT and exercising every day is actually what got me through that super anxious time of my life. Um, and then I basically found that, and back in that, back in those days, I was actually working in publishing. So um, totally different. So totally different career, um, just corporate, just really long hours, um, totally different vibe. But I found that I was actually giving a lot of um, my advice to everyone that I worked for or worked with. And, um, and before I knew it, I was like thinking, you know what, I actually think I want to get into the health and fitness industry because it, it really did. I feel like it really did save my life or at least saved my sanity. Like I didn't end up having to take meds or anything. Not that I'm against taking medication for, you know, depression or anything, but I was like super anxious. So, and all the time. And it's really what got me through those really, really troublesome times. So, um, yeah, so it was about eight years ago that I did my, actually nine years ago, probably that I did my um, personal training course and I got into the industry about, say, seven and a half, eight years ago and full time for about seven years now. And um, I was working for um, a gym called Virgin Active. I've also done boot camp um, and I now have my own business called Busy Bods. And now my real passion is to help with women's health, essentially. So there's a lot more to personal training than just training people. There's all your mindset, there's your nutrition, there's spirit, there's, you know, there's emotions, there's like so much involved in it. So basically today, um, I'm going to start by talking about some hormonal issues that a lot of women have been having. And because basically my demographic now is pretty much that 35 to 45 year old um, age group. And I find that this is actually the time that women really start to struggle with losing weight they might have even been doing exercise they're still like they've been doing the same exercises and they're still eating the same way but they actually start to put on weight at this age um, so I've really tried to make it a mission of mine to work out why it's happening because there's actually not a huge amount of information out there has anyone ever looked into it at all like it's actually quite hard to find the information out there so Basically, and I didn't even know that this existed. And so what I'm going to start by talking about is perimenopause. I just thought before it was just menopause and that was it. So I don't know if I was naive, but I had not heard anything about perimenopause. Um, but this is basically how I'm going to start it. But and I'd also like to clarify as well, as you know, I'm not a doctor. OK, so this is just some advice I'd like to give you and just creating awareness. OK, because there's a lot of lifestyle changes we can make before we need to actually go and see a doctor. So I recommend trying different things for about three months. And then if things aren't working for you, then maybe you need to go and see a doctor. Um, and that's just like my recommendations for anything like physio health, chiro, nutri nutritionists, naturopaths, everything. So I'll always um, recommend like other professionals when I can't help any longer. So let's start with perimenopause um, or also known as second puberty. So this is the two, this can be like two to 10, 12 years um, before the final period. Okay. So um I didn't realize that this went on for such a long time, but this was, yeah, this is the time. Actually, I'm just going to share my screen so you don't actually have to see me the whole time. Just wait one second. 
Um, one second, girls. So, no, I got a big essay, Woody. All right, so uh, let me just try to just to mute everybody. Uh, hmm. Oh, you want to see all right, excuse me. I'm just trying to, all right, mute all. Okay, mute all. All right, there you go. See, I told you I'm not very good with technology. Okay. <laughs> all right, so, okay. So let's get to um, perimenopause, okay? This is where I was at. Okay, so perimenopause, as I was stating, is all known as second puberty, which can last for like our, anywhere from like two to 12 years, okay? Um, and so, and it's actually a life phase. Uh, so menopause is actually, so it's different from menopause. Okay. So menopause is when it's after, is actually the life phase after your final period. Okay. So perimenopause is actually leading up to your last period, essentially. Um, and the normal age for a final period is anywhere between the age of 45 to 55, um, and as I said, it can last for like 10 to 12 years. I mean, some people it's like two years, okay? So this just this is all very individual. Um, and perimenopause cannot be diagnosed by an FSH or follicle stimulating hormone, um, as, which is associated with reproduction and the development of eggs in women and sperm in men um, or any other lab test, okay? So it can't be, it, it can't be diagnosed through a test, okay? Um, but according to um, the Canadian endocrinology professor, Geraldine Pryor, she's, she says a midlife woman with regular cycles is likely to be in perimenopause if she notices any of the three changes in their life, okay? So it's things like, so number one is a new onset or heavy period, okay? This is actually something I've noticed has changed as I've gotten older. Um, in especially just the last couple of years, I've noticed. Um, two shorter menstrual cycles, so cycles which are then like less than 25 days. Um, new, no, number three is new, um, sore, swollen or lumpy breasts. So some women might have that their whole life, but some women might only have it as they're in that perimenopausal age. Um, um, four, new mid-sleep waking. Um, this is another really common one. Um, five, increased menstrual cramps. Um, six, onset of night sweats, in particular menstrually. Um, seven, new or markedly increased migraine headaches. Um, eight, new or increased premenstrual mood swings. And nine, weight gain without changes in exercise or eating, as I touched on before. So in other words, if you're older than 35 and you have at least three of these systems, there's a good chance that you could be per perimenopausal. But not this does not mean that 100% that you are, okay? This can always be other health conditions as well, but it is a very good chance that you are. So... Um, in the early phases of perimenopause, you'll find the biggest change is actually the lowering of the progesterone due to the luteal phases. So this occurs, so the luteal phase is actually the time that you ovulate, so just after you ovulate. So when you release an egg and before your period starts. So just so that middle of your period, I mean, sorry, the middle, so when you're ovulating, to when your period starts. So that is the luteal phase. Um, and, the, and you also are more likely to have more anvularity cycles, okay? So that means you're not ovulating, okay? So despite having periods. So you can still be having periods in perimenopause, but you're not actually ovulating every time because the progesterone has dropped essentially. So... Um, and what happens is the lowering, lowering of progesterone contributes to anxiety, 
um, breast pain. It can contribute to heart palpitations, night sweats, uh, frequent migraines, um, and the crazy heavy periods. Um, at the same time that the progesterone drops away, estrogen spikes, okay? So it can, the estrogen can actually spike like to three times the amount of what it normally is, okay? So this is what contributes to the irritable moods, the breast pain, and the heavy periods. So basically, ladies, we're seriously on this crazy hormonal roller coaster, okay? So our progesterone is dropping and our estrogen is just going up and down, like literally up and down the whole time. So no wonder, you know, everything's all going all over the shop, okay? So you can see why um, some of the specialists actually call it a second puberty because it really is like that. And then it's leading up to your menopause. So just like when teenagers are leading up to adulthood and the hormones are going all, all over the place, same thing's happening for perimenopause and leading up to menopause. So like I said, we're on a roller coaster. So um, now I've definitely, you know, has anyone else put your hands up? Have you had any of these changes? Has anyone else noticed any of these changes? Yeah. So it's, and have you wondered why? Like jump on if you want, actually, let me just, I just want to unmute everyone just for a second. Okay. They just come on. You should be able to unmute yourself, I think, if you want to come on and say hello. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear? Can you jump on? Does anyone want to jump on? Hi, Lisa. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you noticed any of these changes at all, Sarah? Um. I don't know. I'm 39, so I'm just before the 40 yeah. point and probably like weight gain I'd say for me is one that like in the last few years that's been so much harder than like when I was 20 or 25. <laughs> Absolutely yeah um, but that's the main thing nothing else has anyone else has anyone else noticed any differences that they want to share you don't have to share I've I personally have noticed the heavier period, the um, um, not so much weight gain, um, the and the sleepless nights. Okay, so more. Well, mine's not sleepless nights. I actually fall asleep all right, but I wake up in the middle of the night, and I did not realize that that was such a like a condition. Um, and also, I've noticed like the sore the sore of breast. I actually kept on freaking out, thinking I was pregnant again. <laughs> <laughs> which is not what I want to happen at the ripe old age of what nearly 47 so <laughs> I'm so not keen for that <laughs> so anyway that's been my couple of things that I've noticed um but anyway no one else wants to share that's so fine yeah me oh yeah sorry who, what's your name yes. sorry? Eva hi Eva nice to meet you hi I can fall asleep not a problem but I wake up about two, three o'clock and then I can't go back to sleep. Yeah. Um, I, might, I don't eat as much, but I food don't interest me as much. Yeah. And I have night sweats and my period have gone down from five to two days. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you've definitely got a few different things going on, Eva. So how old are you? Uh, 47. Yeah, okay, so similar age to me, yeah. So that's it. Like there's a very, you know, if we're not if we're not starting to see things now, like, you know, it'd be pretty unusual because what's that's putting us at menopause at like 56, 57, which is sort of getting a little bit older anyway. So it's more, you know, it's, yeah, it's definitely I think the time when we're going to be starting to notice some sort of differences. All right, so let's move on. So... Like I said, um, yeah, so anyway, so another thing that, well, as I did mention, so weight gain around um, the abdominal area is really, really common. Um, and it's quite often, it's actually due to insulin resistance. So this is, um, a, or a autoimmune diseases. So we're actually more susceptible to autoimmune diseases 
around this age as well. Um, and, and look, and also for the women actually that are a bit younger, it's still good for you girls to all be aware of what, you know, can be happening in the next five years or so. Um, so insulin resistance is a condition of having chronically elevated levels of insulin. Um, it's also called metabolic syndrome or pre-diabetes. There's some other names for it as well, but they're too medical for me. Um, <laughs> and there's, um, and, and, and is a major player in many women's health conditions, um, including PCOS, so polycystic ovary syndrome, acne, fibroids, um, perimenopause, and heavy periods. So insulin resistance um, can cause abdominal weight gain and is a risk factor for diabetes, cancer, um, osteoporosis, osteoporosis, dementia, and heart disease. Um, and there's a way to find out if you do have insulin resistance um, by actually testi testing for insulin resistance. Um, so there's a blood test. Um, so you're testing for insulin resistance. It's not a test for glucose, okay? So instead, it's a test for the hormone insulin, either as fasting insulin or an oral glucose tolerance test with insulin, otherwise known as a craft test. Now, this glucose tolerance test um, is actually given to you when you're, when you're fasting. A glucose sorry, tolerance test is when you give a fasting blood sample and then you drink a glucose drink um, before giving two more samples at one and two hour intervals. If you're going to have the test, it's much more useful to have it with insulin so you can actually see your insulin readings. So, um, and you can go to like a doctor and actually ask for that specific test, but you actually need to be specific about it. Um, if you want more details, I'll like put in like the numbers and stuff that is, is best um, to see if you're insulin resistant or not. Now, it's really important. So we can be carrying fat in different areas, but the weight around our waist is the most important area that needs to be smaller. Okay, so we can have, be bigger through the thighs and bum and arms, everywhere else. It's around the waist that's, that becomes problematic. So, um, and the insulin resistance can actually cause the apple-shaped obesity. So that before it was always about if you're too big and you have that apple shape, then that means that you could end up with diabetes. But the research now says the opposite way, that you might have insulin resistance. And so therefore that is what's causing the weight gain, okay, around your stomach. So it's when you end up with that apple shape look, okay, which is quite common for the 40, you know, the 40 year old ladies. Okay. So, um, and, and as a woman, your, your risk, so the risk starts when your waist circumference is greater than either 80 centimetres or 32 inches, okay? So it's something that you do want to check out, okay? So it's really important that you work on it because it will lead to a lot of other problems. Um, but also, you also must note that you don't have to be overweight to have insulin resistance, you can have a normal BMI and still, but still have elevated insulin. Okay. So um, now high dose fruit, but look, we can, as I mentioned before at the beginning, so we can make all these different lifestyle changes to help ourselves. Okay. So one of the things um, that we can do is we can actually reverse insulin resistance by making some lifestyle changes. So, uh, and one thing that um, comes to mind is high fructose, so high dose fructose. So it can induce fatty liver and insulin resistance. So the simplest way to reverse insulin resistance is to basically stop having fruit juice or other sweet drinks, which is probably very obvious, and cutting back on dessert or dessert-like foods. That means no sweetened yogurt, no granola bars, no date balls, no agave um, or other natural healthy desserts. So even though we think like all that dried fruit, like our date balls and stuff like that, our energy balls, they're not necessarily good for you, okay, because it's still actually got high sugar. 
This is just if you've got insulin resistance. Of course, it's nothing wrong with you having that if you don't, okay? But these are different things that we can try if you notice that you're, you've are you got these different symptoms. So, um, yeah, so there's different things that you can use. Like you can still use um, stevia as a sweetener, um, xylitol, rice malt syrup, or monk fruit. So it just doesn't spike the insulin like the other sweeteners do. Um, now, a really good, I'll just mention just a couple of supplements. Lisa? Yeah. Sorry. What about normal? What about fruit? Yes, that is fine. Yeah. So okay. Fruit is actually fine to have. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's not recommended to have, you know, tons of, say, bananas and make like this really sweet fruits, like berries and stuff are definitely better. But the research I've done so far, it looks like you can still have fruit. It's not like, but it's, you wouldn't go crazy on it. So you know how it's generally recommended that you want to have like two serves? That's mm. basically what you want to stick to. You can have a lot more berries because berries don't have the same amount of fructose that um, we don't have the same amount of sugar content as a banana. And, I mean, that also depends on what time you're eating the banana too because the, when it's green, it actually doesn't have much sugar. So, but with their, I just keep mentioning bananas because they can go quite sugary and sweet. Yes. But it's not. It's more the dates and all the processed sugar that you really need to, you know, avoid as best as possible. Um, okay. Any other questions? Um, yeah, so, yeah, so the other, um, yeah, sorry. Um, so something that I wanted to mention is supplements. So one of the supplements which can be really beneficial is, um, is and, and magnesium actually can be really helpful because magnesium deficiency is actually a contributor to insulin resistance. So fortunately, taking magnesium has found to improve insulin resistance. So you want to, but just make sure you're, the only problem, there's only one problem with magnesium is if your blood um, blood pressure is too low, like mine's lowish, but I can still take magnesium. I'm not quite sure of how low, but sometimes that can affect you. So you'd have to maybe just go, if you do have low blood pressure, maybe just speak to your doctor about that. Um, yeah, so magnesium. So magnesium has some great benefits. Okay, so including regulating the HPA axis, um, which is our adrenal glands, um, improving sleep, supporting progesterone, curbing sugar cravings. How good? <laughs> um, reducing inflammation, and it combines well with taurine and amino acid that also improves insulin sensitivity. So. We also want to maintain a healthy um, um, uh, circadian rhythm and sleep, okay? So circadian rhythm um, or body clock, so it has a profound effect on glucose metabolism. It's actually the word circadian. I just lost my words for a second. <laughs> circadian rhythm. Um, um, yeah, so glucose metabolism and whole body insulin sensitivity and regulation of the circadian rhythm is a contributing cause of insulin resistance, okay? So the best way to support circadian rhythm is to maintain regular patterns of eating and light exposure. So, for example, tell your body it's morning with protein and bright light. So it's really recommended to get outside in the morning Okay, so you actually know that it's the morning. Um, I think we all know about blue lights and, and bedtime and what have you, but it's just as important to actually see the daylight early in the morning as well, even if it's just for five minutes. So just getting out for five minutes to see that it's light. Not, and the other recommendation is to um, also have some protein. Okay, so um so protein and bright light and then in the evenings send your brain the opposite signal okay so we want to be then resting and dimming with the pink light but I think a lot of people already know that look a lot of us may not be doing that but <laughs> I think we're all pretty aware of that but we may not be I feel like not as many people are aware of like the morning how important that is um so and of course um yeah so basically yeah so to, to 
to maintain a healthy um, circadian rhythm, um, it will, you know, it's going to help promote better sleep. So, you know, if we're in that perimenopausal stage, we want to make sure that we're having a good sleep. So it's a really important strategy um, also for maintaining healthy levels of insulin. So it all comes into play. So um, there's a lot of different factors that come into it. Now, moving your body is, of course, another one. Exercise improves insulin sensitive sensitivity in the muscles by increasing the number of mitochondria. So they're these little power um, powerhouse cells, and they basically turn food into energy. So building healthy muscle also requires sufficient dietary protein. So that's another thing that we need to make sure we're having enough of. Um, um, and resistance training, uh, HIIT and yoga have actually proven to be the most beneficial training for this age group. So not um, running and doing long runs. A lot of people, especially once they get to that age, they want to do all this really high intensity stuff because they feel like that's the only way that they're going to lose weight. That's not the case at all. You're actually better off just doing some strength training with a bit of HIIT. Uh, you can do like your walks, your long walks and stuff like that. You can still do like a run, but you don't want to be doing runs all the time. You want to really be focusing on doing your resistance training. Yoga is good as well. Um, I'm just not a yogi. <laughs> um, so another thing that I might like to, would like to mention is hormonal birth control can also impair muscle gain and cause insulin resistance. This is something that I've only just found out. Um, so this is, that's one of the reasons why birth control can actually cause weight gain. So birth control with a high androgen index can also directly cause insulin resistance and the abdominal weight gain. So that's another thing that you might want to look at as well, okay? Um, so you might find also that in your 40s or that you're starting to feel more stressed, okay? So, um, or even in your mid-30s, okay? You just may not be coping as well with stress as what you had done before. Um, and it happens because of we're losing the progesterone. Again, this bloody progesterone <laughs> causing all, all crazy havoc. So, um, and so it can destabilize the HPA adrenal axis. So, and the, the HPA axis um, dysregulation is actually a medical, is a me medical term for adrenal fatigue. So, or stress response system. So this recalibration of this nervous system is actually why perimenopause is associated with an increased risk of anxiety, depression, and insomnia. So what women could sometimes find is they do feel quite stressed and anxious at, in, at this age group and they might go to the doctors and then the doctors, I'm not saying all doctors, but quite often doctors will then prescribe um, antidepressants and, and, and any anxiety medication. Now, I'm not against these medications when you need it, but there's always like, and if you're in a situation where you really need it, I'm definitely all for it, but you can, you want to be making lifestyle changes as well. So, you know, ideally you don't want to be on medication, but you know, sometimes that can't be helped. Sometimes I've actually had clients go on medication and then they've changed their lifestyle and then they've gone off the medication because lifestyle always wins. But sometimes you just, some people just do need a little bit of extra help with medication. But generally speaking, the doctor's, will just give you medication without recommending a lifestyle change. Um, but look, like I said, there's always, you know, there's always a place for medication as well. Um, so, 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 so progesterone is a stress buffering hormone. So by converting to the beneficial neurosteroid alpogegarone, I think that's how I pronounce it, or alpogranelone, I don't know. It's one of those huge words. <laughs> Um, it, so, and progesterone calms GABA receptors and stabilizes the HPA adrenal axis. So it also promotes neurogenesis, which is just new nerve growth. 
and in the hippocampus, which further supports a healthy adrenal access, okay? So progesterone basically drops in perimenopause um, and, merit, and, the, and the progesterone actually drops before the estrogen does. So, so in a fascinating new study called the estradiol and progesterone as resilience markers, um, researchers found that a lower level of progesterone in perimenopause is, associ is associated with lower life satisfaction, higher perceived stress, and an increased risk of depression and anxiety. So the same was not true for the lower the lowering of estrogen. So it's the progesterone that is messing with us, okay? So that's the thing that's making us not feel so great. Thanks a lot, progesterone. <laughs> Just stay for a bit longer. All right. So how to support your nervous system during perimenopause. So we need to be make, making more time for ourselves. Okay. So more rest and self-care. So you're basically at a really vulnerable time, um, but it won't last forever. And you have permission to slow down um, and, to, and basically look after yourself until you achieve menopause. Um, and one easy way to promote relaxation is to activate the vagus nerve and parasympathetic nervous system. Now, I know you're probably all thinking, like, how the heck am I supposed to slow down? I've got kids, I'm working five days a week, I've got everything going on, like, you know, don't tell me to relax. <laughs> so, and myself included, um, when I was all like reading this, when I was reading all about this, I was like, oh my God, how this is like the probably the most chaotic time of my life. How the heck am I supposed to be achieving relaxation as well? But it is really, really important. And it's good to at least implement a few of the strategies, um, which I'm going to mention. And yeah, and there's also like a few supplements that can help again. And magnesium is another one that I would recommend to actually help you with that. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, but there's, yeah, so there's a few supplements which can help you along with obviously relaxation techniques, which I'm going to go into a bit more in a little bit. Um, so magnesium, as I said before, it's very, very helpful with helping relax you. So not only with helping with the um, insulin resistance, but it does actually help relax the muscles um, another one, as I did touch on before, is the taurine and the amino acid. Okay, so it calms the brain by boosting GABA and blocking glutamate and adrenaline. So some, some naturopaths actually will prescribe like magnesium and the taurine. I haven't actually used taurine myself, but I use magnesium. Um, and another recommendation is to actually reduce histamine and mast cell activation by avoiding cow's dairy um, and alcohol and sometimes um, actually taking an antihistamine can actually help you on a really bad mood day which is something quite interesting which I didn't know but um, yeah they're just a couple of supplements that you can try out like I said I haven't actually personally tried the taurine but definitely the magnesium helps so as you can see you know basically our hormones are all over the place um, and so, there, and there's like many reasons why, we, you know, we're not feeling our best um, and, and we're struggling to lose weight. Okay. So, you know, we can't, there really is a lot going on. So I don't want anyone to be beating themselves up about, you know, not being able to lose weight. There's a lot of different things that you need to now try to implement and try. And it's all a bit of experimenting as well. So, um, and like I said before, there's many natural ways um, and lifestyle changes that we can make before we need to go and see a doctor. Okay, unless you really want to see a doctor, of course, go and do so. Um, but I always recommend making different lifestyle changes before you know you go to the doctor and trying for a few months. So the first thing, um, which I'm sure this won't come to be a surprise to anybody is we want to be doing resistance and hit training, okay? As I had touched on before, um, resistance, hit training, and yoga are the most benefit, beneficial exercises um, 
for women of this age group. So did you know that your resting metabolic rate drops by 15% when you hit perimenopause? And this is really why we want to be incorporating that resistance training. So if you want to know what your resting metabolic rate is, so it's actually the amount of energy that you're burning through doing nothing, okay? So, um, so say basically mine's about 1,400 calories a day. So I've done these measurements before and I burn 1,400 calories per day without even exercising. Okay, so that's the resting metabolic rate. So that means now I probably have dropped 15%. So whatever 15% off 1,400 is. So I won't be burning as much as what I normally would have been, but I do resistance training all the time. Like I'm, I'm basically doing generally res resistance training three to five times a week. You don't have to do that many, but that's how much I do. Um, so weightlifting, also known as resistance training, um, has been practiced for centuries. And this is just such a great way to build muscle. Um, and or else there's resistance training, which can be done by body weight, um, you know, resistance bands, machines, dumbbells, um, barbells, anything that basically gets us to build muscle and build strength is going to be a winner. Okay. So, um, because we want to, you know, basically increasing muscle size is going to be the thing that's going to help counteract. Um, age-related muscle loss, which is what we need, ladies. We need to be build, building muscle, okay? So as I did touch um, on before, exercises such as running and cycling are effective for reducing body fat, um, but these activities can actually also decrease our muscle size. So we do not want to be decreasing our muscle size, okay? Um, and that's going to lead to weaker muscles, um, it's going to lead to a greater perceived weight loss because muscle is denser than fat. So you will be losing more weight. But um, unlike endurance exercises, evidence shows resistance training not only has beneficial effects on reducing body fat, it also increases muscle size and strength. Okay. But we also experience the afterburn effect. Okay. So you've probably heard of the afterburn effect. So when we um, exercise, our muscles need more energy um, than they do when resting. So this energy comes from our muscles. So, uh, sorry, this energy comes from our muscles' ability to break down fat and carbohydrates. So this, that's stored within the muscle, liver and fat tissue um, and with the help of oxygen. So during exercise, we essentially are breathing faster um, and our heart works hard, our heart works harder than to pump more oxygen, okay? And fat and carbohydrates to our exercising muscles. So what else? So the less the one thing that's less obvious is that after we've finished ox, um, training, our oxygen uptake is remains elevated. So in order to restore muscles to their resting state by breaking down stored fat and carbohydrates. So this is actually the phenomenon which is called post-exercise oxygen consumption um, or known as the afterburn effect. So it basically describes how long oxygen uptake remains elevated after exercise in order to help the muscles recover. So it's just working those muscles is just going to, it's, and because it's using so much more carbohydrates and fat and oxygen then say if we're just going for a run that's why it continues on basically once we're resting and sitting around and what have you as opposed to just going for a run okay um so and another form of training which i did mention before is high intensity interval training or known as hit training okay so there's multitudes of benefits to hit training okay um, and um, so the main ones are, okay, is it includes like lean body mass. It also improves insulin sensitivity um, and improve mitochondrial function. They're the little powerhouse 
cells, okay, which is um, what I was what I mentioned before. So they're the ones that take, you know, that help turn the energy we 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 take in, and then it turns, um, and then sorry, takes takes the energy we take from food into energy, and then um, the cell can actually be used. Okay, so this is really really important to include HIIT training. So HIIT workouts are like actually designed just so you are really pushed to your limits, basically, um, but in short bursts. Okay. And there's different ways, you know, there's different forms of HIIT training and it just depends on how sort of advanced you are and also it helps like whether you've got a trainer or not with you as well. Um, so, you know, so basically when setting up workouts, HIIT workout, workouts for yourself, there's a few things that we need to think about. So it's about duration, intensity, frequency and the length of recovery, okay? So how long you rest between intervals depends on your fitness levels and goals. So an advanced exercise are all probably what I get most of my clients to do after they've been training with me for a week <laughs> is more like a two to one. So that means that you're going to be working for, you know, say um, 40 seconds and then you're going to be resting for 20 seconds. Okay. So that's, that's, that's a bit more of a challenging one or, you know, you're working for, two minutes and resting for one minute. Um, or else there's the other one, which is another one that I quite like, is Tabata, which is 20 seconds of work and 10 seconds off. And they only go for four minutes, but I'd have you like doing several of those. Um, and for a less intense workout, um, the ratio might, ratio might be more like a one to two. So say you'd be working for 30 seconds and then you'd be having one minute rest. So you can keep, you know, you can sort of mix and match these as well. And you can even, it can also depend on what sort of day you're having. You might be like, oh, I want to do a hit session, but I'm not really feeling it today. So increase your rest. Okay. So just, you know, do, do the 30 minutes, of, I mean, 30 seconds of work and the one minute of rest. Okay. So it's just, you know, it's all about trying to incorporate training on a regular basis but also go by how you're feeling, okay? Um, and like I mentioned to you before, so it's, you know, yoga is another really good one, which is recommended, but it's just not my thing. <laughs> like I actually don't mind it, but I don't train it. <laughs> so too much other stuff going on. But anyway, but it is another really good one to incorporate into it if you want to um, do something different. But this is just what the re all the research I've read so far is all heading towards is just resistance training number one with a bit of hit and then and of course like doing your walks and stuff as well is really good for you um and then and yoga so you know it's about trying to train to suit our bodies essentially and what we're going to benefit from so you'll get told that all these different you know you'll get told all different things are going to benefit you but this is seriously what i have found has been the best for myself and what works the best with my clients as well. And also there's a lot of research that states this as well. Okay, so let's talk about whole foods. <coughs> so I guess everyone knows they should be eating whole foods. Yes? <laughs> All right, so nutrition is one of my favourite topics, but I totally get why everyone is confused by nutrition. Is like what there's a new fad and phase and diet what every minute or so I swear it's just like ridiculous like I find it I, it's very confusing okay even myself I sometimes get caught up in stuff and I think oh maybe I should try that but it's like even though I know that it's just a load of non <laughs> nonsense but you know marketing is amazing <laughs> and it can really suck you in so, um, and look, it's true that, you know, we can, you know, it's, it all comes down to calories in versus calories out. And you can actually lose, you know, weight through not being on a great diet, but not so much once you're over 35. So when you're younger, you could literally just eat Mars bars, but not many of them and probably lose weight as long as you were in a calorie deficit. Okay, so you could probably eat a lot of, you can actually eat a lot of crap food. Well, not a lot of crap food, a bit of crap food and lose weight. But as we get older, 
we're more sensitive and we can't, it's actually not about just calories in versus calories out. It's actually about the quality of food that we're eating, as I've been mentioning to you um, earlier. Um, but look, there's, you know, there's many arguments about which is the best diet. And nevertheless, I think all health and wellness communities all agree, like whether you're paleo or, or um, you know, like plant-based or keto or whatever, most of them are generally still promoting a lot of vegetables, okay? So it's always like vegetables are still like the number one sort of um, source of food. And then you're obviously going to have your proteins and fat as well, okay? Um, so, but there's also, so there's actually been a lot of um, research into um, helping with the insulin resistance again and for the perimenopausal women. And they've, they've found that intermittent fasting can work quite well. So who's heard of intermittent fasting? Put your hands up, anyone that's on camera still. Yeah. So with your intermittent fasting, um, so what is it? So it's a lifestyle, okay? So it's a lifestyle um in which you eat either like during times, during certain times of the day or certain days of the week, okay? So there's a ton of different ways that we can do intermittent fasting. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you about a few of the different ones. Um, so there's a time-restricted feeding. So time-restricted feeding is also called daily fasting. So in these fasts, you fast every day and you divide the 24-hour day into feeding and fasting windows. So there are some popular versions, but you could choose any ratio of 24 hours um, with the goal being to shorten your feeding window and lengthening your fasting window. So um, an example of one would be a 14-10. So that means that you would be fasting for 14 hours and feeding for 10, okay? Um, or you've got like a 12-12. 12-12 is sometimes good for people to just start. It can just help with like reducing snacking and what have you. I personally think I've only ever really eaten a 12-12, to be honest with you. I never ate breakfast early. So I think I used to eat breakfast at about nine and finish eating by about eight. So I've never really done, um, had to, you know, try to change my eating too dramatically. Um, 16, eight, which is one that I quite often do because I've actually played around with some intermittent fasting. I don't do it every day. Sometimes depends on my training and also my work when I can actually eat. <laughs> so, um, but 16, eight, I actually really like. Um, so this one, you know, you could, um, have a meal at, say, 10 a.m. You could have breakfast at 10 a.m., um, say, a 2 p.m. lunch, and then have dinner at, like, 6. Well, actually, you need to be finished by 6, okay? Um, I personally am more like around about eating at about 11, between 11 and 12 and finishing eating between 7 and 8. That's generally how I do it. It's, um, it actually works in well with my lifestyle. Um, Can I ask a question? What sure. about coffee in the morning? Um, so so if, if you do yes. this, you don't have a coffee until 11 no, or 10? No, you can have a black coffee. Okay, all right. You can have black coffee. Look, there's been a few arguments with this one, but most mm. of them, well, most of the research says that you can still drink <laughs> coffee or black tea or like um, lemon water. And after and, and, um, and water, of course. And after you stop eating, can you have like peppermint tea, herbal teas at night? Yeah. Okay. So that works as well. So you can still have essentially water. You just can't have like any milk in it. Like you, you couldn't actually have as soon as you have the milk, you know, whether it's almond milk or what have you, then that means that the fast is over. So, the thing with this one I think is confusing is the message has always been you need to continually eat to keep your metabolism going and it's kind of flipped it back the other way. Yeah. So if you really look at how we used to eat, like back in the, I know it was a bit different when we were like 
having to catch our food and, you know, there was no supermarkets and stuff. People didn't eat, they used to, we actually just naturally fasted for days at times or maybe you'd eat some berries. You'd only eat meat, you know, every week or something like that. Um, it's not, it's, it's, all of, it's all been about marketing. That's the reason why, like I got brought up thinking that I had to have breakfast as well. And like what you said, Catherine, as well, like I, I went through this stage where I used to eat like all the time. But apparently what happens is we're, our body needs time to actually rejuvenate the cells. So this is why fasting is really good. And a lot of like cultures and religions do incorporate fasting and they do it for like, you know, I mean, they don't do it every day, but they might do it for a month or two months and they can only eat when it's dark and all sorts of stuff. So this is the other thing is like you can do like 24 hour fasts and stuff like that as well. But it's um, there. There's also like the five two. Um, which I was going to go into. So this is that's a pretty. I think everyone's quite familiar with that one. Was, I think um, it was Michael Mosley actually. He introduced it about ten years ago, um, and his was all. It was all for like weight loss. Um, so this is one where you'd like eat normally for five days, and then you'd have two days um, where you restrict your calories. I think you on the fasting days, I think you don't totally fast. So you have about five. I, I don't quite understand it personally because you're restricting your calories, but you're not really fasting, fasting. So it's, I don't like, I, the only thing I can see is you still, your body's not having to digest as much. Like I get it more when you're not eating at all. I understand that fasting. I don't quite understand the five, two, but um yeah, but the way that he does it is you just eat normally for five days. Then you have two days. They don't even have to be consecutive days um, where you eat. I think it's 500 to 800 calories. So depending on if you're a male or female or the size of you. Um, so for those two days, but that it's not like you actually have to. So you could eat, you could spread your 500 calories out over the day if you wanted to. So you're not necessarily fasting fasting but anyway that's another one which is um which was what quite well known has anyone heard of that five two yeah yeah so that was yeah that was pretty that was pretty popular that's actually the, that's what i i i actually tried the five two many years ago but because of all my training i just didn't cope well with it because <laughs> eating 500 calories on a day of training was like oh, i i was trying it and then i was trying to like you're not supposed to train and I didn't want to train I mean I wanted to train so um I was like waking up in the middle of the night and just like starving <laughs> I was like I can't do this so then I started doing more research into different fasting because I'm like this cannot be the only way of fasting and that's actually when I started doing the 16 8 and that was like no that works well for me I'd like fast all morning and then that's because when I'm actually hungry is from lunchtime, more dinner time. So that's when I'm actually the hungriest. Um, yeah, but there's other types of, so yeah, so there's other types of fasting as well. So there's an uh, ADF. So this is an alternate daily fasting. So um, so as it implies, like the name implies, you eat regular meals one day and then you fast the next day. So this is so this is usually a, a water only fast um, but it can also be modified to so apparently this one can also be modified to a 500 to 750 calories day as well so it's not so it's sort of similar i suppose to the five two in some ways but you're just alternating days um so if you think but also if you think of it in terms of time restricted feeding it's like 36 12 basically um so in which you stop eating after dinner on day one for example like you stop at 7 p.m and then you'd fast all of day two and then you would break your fast day three with a breakfast at 7 a.m so this would add up to 36 hours of fasting and 12 hours of eating but i personally have not tried that <laughs> um but there are many more styles but you know 
that's yeah there's like like I said there's tons of different intermittent fasting that you can try um and anyway if you want any more tips on that like reach out and I can help you with that as well um so and like I said yeah so you can drink your your coffee and your and your tea and your lemon water now the next um research that um there's been like a fair bit of research done on menopausal and premenopausal women is they found that a low carb diet can be really beneficial um so it can help with your insulin resistance again um and the and the perimenopausal age and i'm not saying no carbs either okay so low carb so the difference like keto you've probably all heard of keto um, it can be beneficial for some reasons i'll go into it um, more in a minute um, but it's more about having um, lower carbs. Okay, so lower carb diets can actually reduce your appetite um, because hunger tends to be the worst side effect of like dieting. Um, and studies have constantly shown that people who cut carbs and eat more protein and fat, um, they actually end up eating fewer calories because they believe that it just satiates you more. Um, um, low carb diets also lead to more weight loss at first, but that's more because it's um, you lose water retention. So to begin with, you're actually losing a lot more water, but you're actually also lowering um, your insulin levels, um, which leads to like much more weight loss, at least for like the first two weeks. And then it sort of like stabilizes. Um, but sometimes that can be good for the mind. So just when you actually see the weight drop quickly, that can sometimes be enough for people to go, awesome, you know, this is like the incentive. I've already seen like a couple of kilos drop and then that can just really help with your motivation. So even though it's not actually like you're dropping two kilos of fat, you're at least, you know, you drop, you, you're dropping the water, but it can just really be good for the mind really just to be like yeah all right awesome i've lost that two kilos and then and then you will it's enough to like get you feeling inspired basically um also the, what they've also found is actually a greater proportion of fat loss comes from your abdominal area as i discussed before um not all body fat is the same okay so um, and where the fat determines, I mean, sorry, where the fat is stored actually determines um, how it affects your health and risk of disease. So the low carb diets are effective at reducing like the harmful abdominal fat. Um, so another one is the triglycerides tend to drop drastically. So triglycerides are the fat molecules that circulate in your, in your bloodstream. So we definitely want those to drop as well. Um, you have increased levels of good HDL cholesterol. So the higher your levels of HDL um, relative to bad, so LDL, the lower, the lower your risk of heart disease. So this is really important as well. Um, reduced blood sugar and insulin levels. So low carb and ketogenic diets can be really helpful um, for people with diabetes and insulin resistance, which affect, you know, millions of people across the world. Um, and studies, there's been, a, like, there have been, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of studies that prove cutting carbs lowers both blood sugar um, and insul insulin levels drastically. So as I said before, we can quite often become insulin resistant um, at that perimenopausal age. So I think... That's where, this is why it's super, why it can be really beneficial for this age group. Um, so they also say that it may, this is not so confirmed, but it may lower blood pressure. Um, so elevated blood pressure or hypertension is a significant risk factor um, for many diseases. So including the obvious one, um, heart disease, and then stroke and also kidney failure. So it's also another one um, that's effective against metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is, you know, is highly associated with the risk of diabetes and heart disease, again. Um, and it also is proven to um, help with your bad 
LDL cholesterol levels. So people who have, as I mentioned before, who have bad LDL are much likely to have heart attacks. So, um, but however, so this actually the size of the particles is important. So smaller particles are actually linked to a higher risk of heart disease while larger particles are linked to a lower risk. Um, so it turns out that low-carb diets increase the size of the bad LDL particles while reducing the number of the total LDL particles in your bloodstream. Um, and another one which I find is really quite interesting is it's therapeutic for several brain disorders. So your brain actually needs glucose. Um, and as some parts of it can only burn this through um, sugar, through types of sugar. Um, that's why your liver produces glucose from protein. So if you don't eat carbs, um, yet a large part of your brain can also burn ketones. So which are formed during starvation or when carb intake is really low. So this is the mecha mechanism behind the ketogenic diet which has been used for decades to actually treat um, epilepsy in children. So they actually use the, um, they use the ketogenic diet. That's why this actually was developed in the first place, was for kids that had really severe epilepsy um, and weren't responding to drug treatment. So it's pretty amazing how important food is <laughs> So and how much you know, we can change our diet and how much it can actually change our health. So it's actually incredible. Um, so I generally recommend eating lower carb during the day. Um, and this has been another recommendation through several naturopaths that I've been reading up on and dietitians. Um, so having, so helping with insulin resistance and perimenopause again. Um, so it's recommended, yeah, so, and this is the way I'd eat as well. So having a bit lower carbs throughout the day. But then for dinner, you want to make sure it's like really nourishing and you've got like all macronutrients um, included. So you could have like fish and rice or say chicken and sweet potato. Um, of course, heaps of greens. I'm always like tons and tons of greens. I pretty much fill my plate with greens and then I've got my, you know, my protein and then my carb source as well. But it's whatever, whenever I'm eating, it's like I have a big, you know, if I have a salad, it's a huge bowl of like the vegetables and then I've got my protein and then like my carb source as well. Um, yeah, so you can go crazy, especially with your green vegetables and it'll make you, and it'll make you feel fuller. Um, yeah, so the import, so basically, like I said, the, <coughs> the important thing is that you eat all three macronutrients. So your protein, your fat and your starch um, so, cause you need, you know, you need them for satiety. So, and you need them for everything, you know, they basically need, you need this for, to, for your body to be working at its optimal health. Okay. So for example, um, protein supports muscles and signals circadian rhythm, um, fat delivers fat soluble nutrients and starch feeds healthy intestinal bacteria activates thyroid hormone, um, activates, oh, wait, where am I at? Sorry, excuse me. Um, uh, activates thyroid hormone and promotes relaxation, sleep, and ovulation. So this is why I recommend having carbs in the evening. So that's another one which I think most of us have like, um, heard before, don't have carbs in the night. Who's heard that one before? And yeah, yep. And we think that, and we've been told that we'll put on weight if we eat carbs in the night. Yeah. Yep. So, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is another load of bullshit. So, <laughs> it won't make you fat. <laughs> so, it's 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 it actually will help you sleep better if you do have some carbs in the night. You so I and but I'm not talking like eating a big pizza. I'm talking about. <laughs> You know, I'm talking about having like a, a like, you know, if I don't know if you've seen those cups of like brown rice, like that much brown rice or that much sort of sweet potato or something like that, because it is actually more um, calorie dense, but it is important to eat that before you go to bed. Um, 
And so, yeah, so carbs are not going to make you fat. <coughs> the thing that you're really much better off doing is quitting sugar, okay? This, like I had touched on before, it's um, reducing sugar and the high dose fructose which is the one that causes, you know, the insulin resistance. So this is the one that we really want to be working on rather than getting rid of our actual carbohydrates. But you can still have, you know, you can still have some desserts with, you know, the xylitol or the stevia. Um, you can, you know, I mean, there's also recommended, you can have like your 85% dark chocolate. Like you can have a couple of squares of that if you're happy to have a couple. <laughs> Not, not a block. <laughs> so, because apparently it's only like one point, I think it's 1.3 grams of fructose um, in 85% chocolate. So it's not like you can't have anything sweet, but it's, yeah, it's, you just, you definitely need to be much more mindful of it. I love sweet stuff. So, and I love chocolate. So <laughs> it's, um it's something that I personally have to like be conscious of and, and work at myself to be honest with you um so any more any questions about the low carb diet or any uh, any other um nutrition questions at all no okay all right so as i mentioned before like sleep is really really important okay um and and you really want to try to getting seven to nine hours sleep. Um, everyone's different with how much sleep they need. Under seven, the research says, and you can start having a lot of different problems. But same with having too much sleep, you can have a lot of different problems as well, um, which I'll go to in a second. But, you know, it's, it's actually just like having a good night's sleep is just as important as everything else, like your exercise, your training, like it's all just as important so your, yeah your exercise sorry your nutrition your sleep they're all as important as each other and i would actually if you had like if you had a terrible night's sleep i'd actually rather you get your go back to sleep okay then have like a really crap night set and then, and then have to get up too early and train because there's there's a lot of there's so many negative effects um associated with not getting enough sleep so i'm just going to go i've listed like 10 here but um there's so much more um the different effects from sleep deprivation is just actually crazy so one is weight gain and obesity um two is diabetes three hypertension um four depression and anxiety um, five is memory loss and lack of focus, which can always feel that one if you haven't had enough sleep, can't you? Um, early onset 606 is early onset dementia. That's pretty scary, especially when there's, um, I've got Alzheimer's in my family. Um, seven is heart attack and stroke. Eight is immune system deficiency. Um, nine decrease um, fertility and 10 low sex drive so i'm sure like most of you have felt the effects of just having you know one or two bad nights sleep um you know your lack of fat you like you'll have you'll lack focus you and motivation that's definitely something that i find you might be grumpy you'll find you want to actually snack on junk food um, and generally you want to snack on sugary food as well. And that's due to a hormone called ghrelin. So it actually will make you want to eat crap food. <laughs> so it's really important. And it's, you, you'll find that you're fighting it. Like I know that if I have not had a good night's sleep, I, I will be, it will be much harder for me to resist bad food. So yeah, Josephine. Yeah. Anyone else? <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, I just uh, one of the things that I didn't realize until a couple of years ago was that I had sleep apnea. And oh. when when I went along to the clinic, I didn't realize the the strong link between weight gain and sleep apnea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does does anybody else in the, the group has anybody else had sleep apnea? And I don't know. Anyone else had sleep apnea? 
No, I think everyone. No, okay. Oh. No, interesting. No, but that's it's actually like you said, Josie. It's like that's it really is um related the lack of sleep and and just as you you it also raises the cortisol levels as well, which causes weight gain. Um. So anyway, so just imagine like what it's doing to your body. Um, if this is like a regular occurrence for you, like it's, you know, there's, and look, I understand like there's times in your life, like when you have young children or just kids in general, or just different things going on where it's harder to get your sleep, but it's also, um, it's actually just really important to try to try to get your seven hours. But research says you can actually catch up as well. So say you have like a couple of crappy nights sleep during the week, you can actually get a bit more sleep on the weekend to try to catch up as well. Um, a thing that I try to do is because I get up between like 4.30 and 5 a.m. Um, sometimes I haven't had enough sleep and I'll literally just have a 20 minute sleep. So it's, and then I'm, I'm pretty good to go for like the rest of the afternoon. So like I might have like a 20 minute sleep at like three o'clock or something like that. I, I set my alarm for like 30 minutes. Um, so that gives me time to fall asleep and then wake up. You don't really want to be having more than 20 minutes because you go into, I don't know, I can't think of what it's called off the top of my head, but you go into another sleep cycle um, and then so say you might have an hour of sleep or something, you go into a different sleep cycle and you end up waking up and you're feeling groggy or even two hours. There's different sleep patterns that you can do, um, which helps restore your sleep. But then there's certain ones which will make you feel worse. So it's about trying to find the happy medium. I don't, you know, the 20 minutes is really good. I can't remember where I learned about the 20 minute one. Um, one of my clients is a doctor. She sent me a whole heap of different sleep patterns like different sleep patterns like uh, years and years and years ago that you can try because they do it like doctors do it and nurses do it um without if you know so where you have enough sleep where you're good to you basically sleep and then you're up again and you you can carry on with your life because that's what they do in hospitals they literally will sleep for 20 minutes and then they're up at you know saving lives so <laughs> Not that I'd be doing that after my 20 minute hit kit, but <laughs> this is what they do. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, so that's so that's definitely something that you can try. Um, and like who's, you know, we don't I don't have more than 20 minutes to give up in the day. You know, I don't do that all the time either. It really depends on my my um my day, but sometimes I'm just so tired and I'm literally dragging my feet around and I'm like, you know what, I'm better off just having that 20 minute sleep. So we really want to focus on having like a good sleep routine. Um, and I'll just give you some tips and, um, but also you don't want to get stressed about this either. And it doesn't have to be a long withdrawn, overwhelming sort of routine either. So one is, you know, basically you like, even though I said you can catch up on sleep, ideally you do want to be going to sleep um, at this and, going to sleep and waking up at the same time every day so you can end up with like if you're having those if you're all over the place you sort of like end up feeling a bit jet lagged so there was something that i read i just can't remember the full details not that long ago and it was you have that so people might get up early or during the week and then on the weekend they have ridiculous amounts of sleep and they're going to bed late they're getting up late and that totally throws your whole body clock out. So, and that's when you feel that sort of jet lag feeling. I think I was like that all of my twenties. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, <laughs> it was like early mornings and then like really good during the week. And then weekend came, it was like, you know, 5am to bed and <laughs> I don't know, getting up at 1pm and you it was that was a mess <laughs> it was a messy time so anyway I don't probably no one in this group is doing that but <laughs> um yeah so anyway it's still ideal so to have yeah so don't sleep in too late like I still generally get up around 5 30 even on my days off um 
Um, so you want to create, so the second one is create a comfy bedroom. So dark, cool and quiet is probably pretty obvious. Um, three, be mindful of what you drink and eat. So you want to make sure you keep caffeine and alcohol to a minimum. So you can be drinking your caffeine, but I mean, everyone's different, but I generally make sure I'm done by midday. I don't drink caffeine after midday. Alcohol definitely affects your sleep. Um, it, so it actually makes you pass out. So it's more like it makes you unconscious. Like I'm not, I'm not quite sure of the amount of drinks that you have to have, but um, there's a certain amount of drinks which then just put you, makes you tired and makes you pass out, but you're actually not sleeping. It's like um, sleeping tablets. So when you're sleep, when you have a sleeping tablet, you're not actually sleeping. You're just unconscious. So this is why you want to make sure that you're really not drinking a lot of alcohol um, to help you have a better night's sleep. I if I have if I have too many drinks, I definitely don't sleep very well. Even like generally more than two it interferes with my sleep. So every everyone, but yes, and a lot of people have had an argument with me about that one about that I sleep so well on alcohol. I'm like, I don't think you're really you're not really sleeping. You're unconscious. <laughs> but anyway, um, so fourth, um, so start an evening ritual. So like I said, this is like you know people that are really struggling with sleep. Like it's just important to try some of these strategies. So you could have like a warm bath, read a book, listen to relaxing music, or you know whatever you find relaxing but like i said like it, this does not have to be going on for like three hours this is like can be like for 15 minutes so because i know everyone's busy here everyone's either busy working ladies or busy mums or busy both so i know every i know that no one has a lot of time so and um another thing is obviously avoiding screen time i think we all know that it's recommended to stop, you know, screen time an hour before. So, you know, I, another thing like listening to um, podcasts, I quite like doing that as well. It just puts my mind at ease and gets my eyes off the, you know, the screen and lights and what have you. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, there was another one, but I can't think. Yeah. So anyway, that's generally what I would recommend to help you with your sleep. Um, so as before, you know, a lot of us are probably feeling a bit more stressed, um, which is, you know, I mean, it's not even just hormones, even if you're not going through perimenopause, if you, you're like busy with work and just, I suppose, this day and age, and, and especially with how things are now with the world, it's all a bit crazy. I think we're all feeling a lot more stressed than what we normally are, even subconsciously. So I don't think I feel like I'm stressed stressed but I definitely feel like I've been going through stages of feeling a lot more run down so I think everyone's feeling it even if they don't even though they might think they're okay so you know I think you, we all need to be quite um mindful of that as well and sort of know when to switch off I'm not very good at switching off so <laughs> I need to <laughs> Someone needs to tell me to stop. <laughs> and that can't be my husband because I don't listen to him. So <laughs> needs to be someone else. <laughs> um, but I did like I did have last weekend off because one, I was having my vaccine, but also I was run down for that whole week. And so I ended up having like basically two and a half days off work. So um I think it's yeah, and so I think even if it's just having that little bit of downtime is really important. But, you know, and de-stressing for, you know, for everyone, it looks different for everyone. So um, but stress management is just basically trying to, you're trying to take charge of your lifestyle, your thoughts, emotions, and the way, way you deal with problems. Um, and I don't know, I know that when I have the downtime, I definitely can think a lot clearer. So it is super important. Um, and no matter how stressful your life seems, there's definitely steps you can take, you know, to relieve the pressure, okay, and gain like a little bit more control. Um, and look, I, I used to be right into like meditation, um, but that's definitely not 
for everyone. Um, and but but it, I find it's it is actually really good. And that's actually something I do in the middle of the night if I wake up. So before I used to be able to do like a silent transcendental, but lately there's too much going on in my mind. So I just use like a calm app or something like that, or headspace or something like that um, to help me relax in the middle of the night. Um, but yeah, there's yeah, like I said. Meditation isn't for everyone. So, you know, you could be like getting out in nature, like Kate. Kate loves that. So, you know, getting out for a big bush walk or something like nature just helps with your endorphins. Um, you could be just reading, journaling, you know, listening to music, basically just anything that helps you relax. You can also go for um, like there's med like meditation walks that you can do as well so I think it's and it, I think it's sometimes good to actually just be by yourself not be with you know like we all we're all probably like going for walks and catching up with friends and stuff which is lovely but I think to really have the that stress release we sometimes I mean catching up with friends is good but sometimes we just need to literally be silent so whether that if you know if you don't want to actually lie there meditating um, going for a walk by yourself can be really advantageous. But I definitely do find that when I do take the time and I meditate regularly, it helps me with like creativity. I definitely have more energy. I sleep better. Like there's so many benefits. Like I just, you know, I just like I definitely feel a lot better. Um, I have like more sense of calm, like, um, and just a better view of everything that's going on in in my life I would say so it's I, I think it's a super I think it's something like I mentioned to you before it really is important that we implement some sort of stress reduction strategies um, and finally um, so just having a positive mindset so I know that that's maybe more challenging at the moment um but you know you know believing in yourself um you know in anything that you, you know, like believing in yourself and just if you think it and you believe in yourself basically anything's possible so i know that's um a lot more challenging at the moment but you know my top 10 tips on how to start believing in yourself is just one is just be more conscious of your choices okay um to identify like any limiting beliefs so in an example would be transforming a limiting belief of say like i'm incapable of reaching my health goals because i've failed at reaching those goals before to say i'm capable of reaching my health goals because i have learned the skills i need to keep myself on track in the future so it's all about trying to and i think it this is really important to be so conscious of our choices at the moment especially with everything else that's going on um and you know i think you know just being grateful for what we have as well is very very helpful so i would be you know and practice you know the law of attraction so so has everyone heard of the law of attraction yeah, so the law of attraction is basically the idea that whatever you constantly think about and put out to the world, um, you will manifest an experience. So it's just, again, like self-belief and really believing if you're going to do something. Kate's been doing that with her workshops lately, haven't you? Um, and if you put it and you're conscious of what you want to do and you put it out there and you put it out there daily, um, it's, it's basically going to happen. So even just like with your health goals, so even like thinking about your health goal in the morning and in the night, so before you go to bed, like even writing down your goal and then um, looking at that in the evening and also in the, um, in the morning when you first wake up. Um, also just like setting yourself smart goals so everyone knows what a smart goal is just a specific measurable achievable um, relevant and time bound goal um, so that's always really helpful um, and also you know just try if you can try and engage in some new activities 
with a really positive attitude. Or, um, so everything that you work at, try to see the positives in it and rather than focusing on the negatives. Um, and then try new things and get uncomfortable with, I mean, sorry, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So this is something that I've been trying to implement a lot this week, I mean, this year by doing workshops and webinars and stuff like that. I don't like talking like this, <laughs> but I am making myself do it. <laughs> so it's about, and I every time before I do it, I'm so stressed out pretty much for the week before it, stressed out all morning, <laughs> um, sweating my head off, like... <laughs> leading up to it but I'm making myself do it so um yeah so yeah so just you know engage in doing different things and and yeah just get comfortable with with um being uncomfortable it helps you grow and develop if you do it if you're never uncomfortable you're never really going to grow and develop it's just like with training so you know uh you're not going to feel comfortable when you're training but than when you're in the middle of the workout, but think of how you're going to feel after you've done it. So as opposed to what it's like in the midst of the workout. Um, another one, talk to yourself kindly, everyone. It's a crap time. Um, make sure that you're kind to yourself, okay? So think about like if you have like little slip-ups, it's not the end of the earth, okay? So don't beat yourself up. So when it comes to like food or exercise or just anything essentially in life, um, I don't want anyone beating themselves up, okay? So sometimes people get really upset with themselves about say a bad, not an, I should say it's not an ideal food choice or something like that. Just, just accept it and move on, okay? Make it that, you know, you're going to make better decisions the next day. Don't, don't, something I don't recommend is go, all right, I'm just going to blow it for the next week. Just start afresh the next day. I go to sleep, start afresh the next day and be a little bit more conscious of your decisions the next day. Um, and yeah, and just accept that you will make mistakes. Okay, everyone makes mistakes at times and we just learn and grow from those mistakes. Um, and nine is like sustain healthy habits. Okay, so just be healthy um, and this is going to help you with your to have a positive mindset okay and just keep on moving forward girls with an open mind okay so if we're going through this perimenopausal stage it's not going to be forever okay and it will and you're going to have days where it's going to be better than others and as I've mentioned to you there are so many different things that we can be working on um, like different lifestyle changes that we can work on before we like, need to um, access professional help from a doctor um, because all of these you know an accumulation of all the different lifestyle um, factors is going to benefit you so like I said it's not just one thing it's not just exercise it's not just nutrition it's just it, every it's all it's all just as important as each other um, and look and you and also just don't think of, you don't have to be perfect Okay, it's, it's about progress, not perfection. So that's another thing that I want you all to like, you know, just realize it's not, it's not about, it's just progressing and trying to do better um, each day. Okay, um, so like I said to you all before, so this is, this is just to create awareness and to give you different lifestyle changes that you can possibly make. But if you do have, um, and you're not necessarily, you might have these symptoms and you may not be perimenopausal. It could actually be another health condition. Um, and so if you implement these different changes and say after three months, you're noticing that there's no changes whatsoever, then I would definitely be seeking um, the advice of like a medical professional or going to a naturopath or dietitian or whatever your jam is um, and getting some more help. So Thank you very much um, for giving up your valuable Saturday afternoon. Um, it's, I really, really am grateful for you, for you all for attending. Um, and I hope you got some value from it. So jump on and um, if you've got any questions, 
um, jump on and let me know. Thanks, Lisa. Thank I'm just, Lisa. Um, I'm very glad to know I'm not the only one. Oh, yeah. no, I'm crazy. I'm like, phew, it's not just me. <laughs> No, well, that's the thing. Is, I, I kind of I, I ran across this um term not long ago as well and I, I started talking to my husband about it and he said yeah but he t oh he just said something that just set me off I'm like I can't talk to you about this and I was just psycho <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I think I'm getting menopausal and he just said something stupid anyway yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah that's thank it. you. And that's it. I think it's just <laughs> trying to create awareness as well. Like I didn't know a lot about this, to be honest with you. Uh, it's mm. sort of like only been like the last, I don't know, couple of years I've been getting more and more into it um, and learning more about it. But I feel like there's not a huge amount of information out there. Um, and I think, you know, just spread the word and let your friends know that they're not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just their bloody crazy hormones <laughs> yes <laughs> which are causing all of this trouble great. so it's um but anyway but i will be talking to all of you soon um and also i've got um and to thank everyone i've got like actually a low carb cookbook um which i'm going to actually put into the group um and you guys are going to have like no one i haven't actually um sent this to anybody yet so you girls will be actually the first ones to receive it so thank you. excellent yeah so thank you again and have a wonderful you. um afternoon okay see ya we'll see you soon, soon. Lisa. you're very welcome bye bye bye, bye. 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 thanks bye. Let's go. Happy?